nuestro invitado de hoy para hacer el, el keynote antes de que empecemos el, el foro de políticas es Mr. James eh, Spensley. Eh, él viene de Apenic, él, 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 él es australiano, él nos está visitando aquí en LACNIC, el, el, el directorio de Apenic decidió eh, tener una, una reunión con nosotros aquí en Montevideo y bueno, este, quisimos aprovechar la experiencia eh, de, de, de James eh, para estar aquí en, en, en LACNIC y bueno, nos, nos compartieron un poco eh, con una plática su experiencia eh, que, 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 bueno, que nos platicara. Voy a presentarlo. Eh, James has been uh, an opening member and part of the internet community for well over 15 years. During this time, he has been a strong supporter of APNIC events. He has, during his career, been technically responsible for the largest build of a, an IP network in Australian history, uh, Comindico, where he looked after much of the business plan and products while managing multi-million dollar budgets, uh, vendor relation, technology, selection, and routing pinning policies. Since then, James founded Bocus, now one of the largest IP backbone providers in Australia and New Zealand. James has successfully managed Bocus into the award, uh, into the award fastest growing technology company in Australia. Bocus now listens at the Australian stock market offers IP transit, data center, and fiber in three markets, Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. James is also a founding director of AUSNOC, Australian Network Operator Group, uh, including funding the first AUSNOC event on his own credit card. James is a current, is a current, James is a current a serving member of the APNIC board, having been elected in 2009. He has served this position for the last three and a half years. Uh, please welcome James. Thank you all. I somehow expected my introduction to be in Spanish, so that rather, uh, rather threw me off uh, to hear it in English. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the LACNIC board for the invitation. Uh, I'm here on behalf of APNIC, uh, meeting with the board, uh, trying to understand more about uh, IP issues and uh, LACNIC issues in, uh, uh, in the region. Uh, so I'd like to thank them for the hospitality and also thank you for uh, the opportunity to present. Uh, my title of my topic is Operating in a Saturated Market uh, and How We Found Growth. Uh, one of the things I sort of tried to find an interesting topic to, uh, to present here is that Australia is now at a point where most people who want an internet connection have an internet connection. So I thought it was an interesting case study to look at that and that look at the relative population percentages that have broadband internet access in uh, South uh, and Latin America. So I thought you know, this is maybe just a glimpse into the future when, uh, when this region's internet uh, uh, penetration level reaches uh, a similar level and what to expect. Uh, so my company, uh, as the introduction stated, I provide wholesale internet access. So I'm an IP backbone, uh, dark fiber, data center and uh, wholesale voice. So we're not a retail ISP, uh, but a lot of my presentation today will deal with, uh, with issues that are facing retail ISPs. Australia is an interesting market because we're an island where it's very disconnected from the rest of the world uh, and we have a very small population base. It's very easy to see trends and issues happen within, uh, within that market. Uh, I'm sure these trends and issues are being faced uh, all around uh, you know, Western Europe or, or North America. Uh, but they're maybe not as noticeable because the, the volume of users and the volume and size of the companies is uh, so much larger. So I think this is a, possibly an interesting little microcosm. Uh, I hope they translate that word correctly. <laughs> but uh, into, into Australia's internet and, and potentially what that means for, uh, for other regions. So Australia, uh, we're a very large island off uh, the south, uh, southeast of, uh, of Asia. Uh, we have a very small population base. We have uh, 20, just a bit over 21.9 million people, uh, but a huge landmass. So I thought it'd be interesting to do a little bit of uh, comparison stats for, uh, for this region. And Australia, uh, by landmass, is actually the uh, sixth largest country in the world, uh, with a little bit over 7.6 million uh, square kilometres, which is interesting. It's almost the same size as Brazil, uh, just a little bit smaller than Brazil. Uh, one of the things I found fascinating was you could fit uh, Uruguay 43 times into the landmass of Australia. 
And it's a pretty impressive stat. Uh, but we're very sparsely populated. We don't have a lot of people in that, uh, that landmass. If you look at the, uh, the second chart here, the, the density of population in Australia, we're 231st out of 242. So we're incredibly dense, uh, sparsely populated. We have 2.7 people uh, per square kilometre. Whereas somewhere like Singapore, which is the most densely populated, has 7,363 people per square kilometre. So networking in those two different environments uh, create different and unique challenges. Australia is very hard to get scale. So what I'll talk about today is how ISPs are, are, are reacting in a market that isn't growing in terms of user numbers. So being uh, English speaking, our content is almost entirely driven out of the US. 80% of our capacity comes uh, via the US, you know, be that from uh, the rest of Asia, be that uh, from Western Europe or, or uh, any other English speaking country. The, the US is our hub for, uh, for interconnect capacity. Uh, so around 20% of our content is sourced locally, things like internet banking, um, news sites, uh, very little video. Uh, very little of the heavy uh, content that gets downloaded on the internet uh, is actually sourced locally. Uh, being an island, we face a number of challenges. You know, we are 20 million people. We are 12,000 kilometres away from uh, our, our source of content. So trying to get the economics to build a cable 12,000 kilometres for 20 million people is actually very difficult. Uh, so internet costs uh, in terms of raw undersea cable costs are much higher. Uh, in Australia than most other parts of the world. Uh, one of the advantages we have is that we're not landlocked. So a number of countries in, in South America have to get their connectivity from another country, pass through those countries, uh, and I think that adds a great deal of com complexity. So the positive thing is all 12,000 kilometres uh, you know, are either international waters, US territorial waters, or uh, Australian territorial waters. Uh, and connectivity is expensive. As I say, I, it's really expensive in Australia. I pulled up uh, just a few stats here. Uh, you know, probably the most relevant one to this region is Miami to Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo. Is, for a 10 gigabit wave, the lease price has dropped pretty significantly over time. It's now around about $133,000 uh, a month for a 10 gig wave. Uh, if you go back a few years, that cost in Australia was $650,000 a month. Uh, and then even today, it's uh, still well north of $200,000 a month. So, you know, we do have very high connectivity costs, uh, certainly compared to, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some of the uh, larger routes like uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific for Tokyo, Los Angeles, uh, and then, of course, London, New York, so linking Europe uh, and North America. Uh, you know, we're a factor of sort of anywhere between 10 and 50 times in terms of our cost. So given we're, uh, a, you know, we have very little local content, and given that we have a very small population base, only 20 million people, uh, huge construction costs to, to get to that capacity, what does the, uh, the Australian retail internet access market look like? Uh, it's actually surprisingly good. You know, I think on world standards, the pricing is, is probably uh, comparable. Uh, but we do have download caps, and download caps are a result of uh, just that raw cost of bandwidth. Uh, so you can see, uh, you know, for the cheapest provider here, uh, they range from sort of $30, and these are equivalent to US dollars, give or take a few percent, uh, up to uh, their unlimited product at $59. Uh, for one of the better uh, premium providers, uh, again, starts at about $29 and runs up to about $109 for uh, a terabyte plan. One of the key things the market does to uh, better affect and more effectively utilise its bandwidth is uh, split it between peak and off-peak. So you'll always see this uh, little, little terms and conditions that 50% of your bandwidth is from 10 a.m. till 10 p.m., and then 50% of your bandwidth from 10 p.m. till 10 a.m. Uh, one of the trends we've seen as that capacity costs have dropped and competition has increased, we've seen caps increase significantly. So if you go back to 2006, 32% of all retail subscribers had a ADSL broadband cap of less than one gigabyte. Uh, today, you know, or in 2010, that's less than 1%. You can see over here about 70% of the population now, uh, or in 2010, sorry, has a cap of greater than 50 gig and then greater than 200 gig. So we've seen a seismic shift in, the, in just the amount of volume of that, uh, of that download cap. 
And you can see that's directly related if you overlay that from 2007 uh, for the cost of bandwidth, 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, bandwidth caps have increased significantly as those internet costs have, have decreased. So the question, you know, in, in this market, do ISPs now earn more money given that they've increased some tenfold, uh, fifteenfold the uh, amount of download caps? Uh, this is an interesting question. I didn't know the answer of it until I'd done this presentation. Uh, and surprisingly not. This is a breakdown of uh, how many customers are uh, paying how much money for, uh, for their services. So if you look at 2006, 21% of customers were paying below $30 a month. Uh, about a third were paying between 30 and 50. And another third were paying between sort of 30, uh, sorry, 50 and $80. Now if you look at uh, you know, 2010, less than 3% are paying below $30. So we've seen a less, less people paying less money, uh, which means a net increase. But there's a large increase here, almost, uh, what's that, uh, 60 to 70% are still in that 30 to $80 range. Pretty much maps you know, where we were sort of four years earlier. Uh, and if you look at the big subscribers, people spending more than $100, it's gone from 7% to 10%. So there's very little shift in the amount that, you know, the average revenue per subscriber uh, over time. Uh, in fact, the, you know, if you looked at it on, a, on an adjusted basis, the, the numbers are very, very similar. So download caps have increased, you know, 10 to 20 fold. Uh, ARPU or service revenue hasn't increased at all. Uh, you know, aren't these ISPs making a lot less money? Well, the answer is well, not quite yet. Uh, we did some analysis uh, along with market clarity to, to find out this is how many gigabytes a user is entitled to download in the blue, so this is their cap on a yearly basis, and then how much they actually use of that cap. So what you can see, where we used to be at around about 50%, people would uh, use 50% of their download cap. As the caps have increased, usage patterns haven't increased in line with it. So there is, there's no bottleneck. You know, caps are really a marketing tool. Uh, people haven't you know, ended up using more internet access just because they've had access to it. Uh, but that trend is obviously increasing. So over time, this will catch up on the ISP. They will end up having to provide more capacity uh, to, as the user uses more of that, uh, of that cap. So ISPs, ISPs are therefore faced with some real issues in Australia. Uh, subscriber, subscribers aren't paying any more money. Uh, usage is increasing over time. You know, those caps are artificially high, but users feel free to download as much as they like. So you can see they'll trend and use more and more uh, internet. So this ISP's not getting more money for that. Uh, even with bandwidth prices dropping, net costs are going to increase for the ISPs. Uh, so to keep growing, ISPs, can they count on market growth? This was the next half. Well, if the, the costs are increasing, maybe they're gaining new users who use less internet, uh, and therefore the averages uh, you know, are working in their favor. So I did some stats on sub fixed broadband subscribers in 2009. Uh, Australia had, in 2009, 5.2 million fixed broadband uh, subscribers. Uh, and that grew in 2010 to 5.4 million. So very, very little growth. In fact, 3.7%. Uh, that's 200,000 homes. So there's almost no growth today. Uh, you know, the market has reached saturation. Most people who have access to internet have purchased that access already today. Uh, so our Broadband uh, penetration level is about 63%, and it's moved to 65% in, uh, in 2010. And if you look at some of the, uh, we're, we're ranked 14th in the OECD uh, broadband penetration rankings. If you look at the USA, uh, they're at uh, sort of 70%, France at 76 and UK at 69 These are much smaller countries, uh, so you know, the copper line can produce uh, you know, or, or access much more subscribers. So you're seeing Australia's at a little bit lower than that because we're so sparsely populated, you know, we can't actually get ADSL or broadband out to a number of the homes. Uh, so on an on a adjusted basis, 63% is probably the equivalent to 70% in some of these, uh, you know, better densi uh, more densely populated countries. So something happened in 2009 to the Australian internet, and I think this happens in, in all markets, but it's just, as I mentioned, easier to, to notice in Australia, given we're an island and we're quite limited in terms of population numbers. Uh, around about 2009, just here on the graph, uh, the number of broadband subscribers just stopped growing. So we went from a market where every ISP could simply just survive on attracting new users to every ISP having to compete with the other ISPs to 
churn or acquire their, uh, their com users competitively. So that's another reason that you've seen those data caps go up, is ISPs are now having to compete with each other rather than for new markets. So as a result, the market got a lot more competitive in 2009. Uh, ISPs started fighting each other for, for those subscribers, uh, and that's another reason, as I said, the download caps increased. Now, if you look at those numbers again, 2009, when, when we saw you know, net subscriber growth start to slow, that's when we saw these, these broadband caps increase. So you know, when you're fighting for the same user, suddenly you have to get uh, more aggressive in the market. So increased competition for churn, no increased in, in the revenue you're getting from your individual users, uh, no real increase in the market size, uh, and your usage on those subscribers is increasing over time. You know, how, does, how does the market react to that? What happened you know, probably in the last two years in Australia? Because uh, ISPs are obviously becoming less profitable. There's no growth uh, and costs aren't dropping in line with usage increases. So how did the market react? Well, the rational thing happened, consolidation. We found a lot of ISPs merging and joining together for the purpose of uh, gaining scale. You can see some, so it's just some from the last few years, there's, uh, you know, Ionet, one of our largest ISPs, bought one of our other largest ISPs, Netscape. Uh, you know, I could have thrown up any number of, uh, of examples here. So we're seeing a lot of consolidation, and that's a direct result of that now no longer new users coming into the market. A lot of our ISPs are publicly listed. They have growth expectations. The only way that they're able to grow is by acquiring other businesses. So the larger and smarter ISPs have realised that to keep growing they needed to be cheaper or offer better services, or actually both, uh, in an ideal world. Uh, and then to do that they have to build scale to get better pricing. Building scale, only way to do that is to acquire users. They also needed to build scale to get better use out of their fixed costs. They'll have the same amount of management, they'll have the same amount of uh, you know, IT staff, they just need to leverage uh, those so those costs are uh, far better in the, uh, in the market. So how do you do that? You, how can you do that if the market is no longer growing? Again, simply just through consolidation. So I got some stats out of the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, our government uh, you know, that tracks uh, statistics across the country. Uh, and you can see right around here in 2009, 2010, we start to see in the, in the category of small, so one to 10,000 user ISPs, a real drop off and trends starting here. Uh, pretty flat, drops from say like 27 to about 24 in terms of medium ISPs. That's 10,000 to 50,000 subscribers. Uh, and the large ISPs have consolidated from 12 down to seven. So in, in net terms, we've seen a drop of about 40 ISPs uh, in the last 18 months. So how, uh, how is Vocus? You know, we've won awards for, for our growth. How have we grown during this period? Uh, we've stayed away from retail. We've focused on products and markets that themselves uh, are growing. Uh, retail ISPs themselves aren't attracting any new users. But if we go back to that graph of the amount of downloads in the blue line uh, that are offered to the customer and how much they're actually using, there's a vast gap there. But that gap will close over time. So it means someone like us who's a wholesale IP transit provider we'll still have access to growth because the users are actually still using more and more content. So this was an area we thought that we could invest in significantly uh, and, and especially an area that others weren't investing because the, you know, the market belief that there was no longer growth in retail access, so no one focused on, on the bandwidth side. So we had very little competition. Uh, so in that period that retail, uh, you know, revenue from the subscribers, ARPU, uh, is staying the same, we've increased revenue uh, in our wholesale internet division, it's just through good market dynamics. People have offered these caps. They've hoped the users aren't going to use them, but the users are, in fact, starting to use it. So we're seeing the market grow for us. Uh, in fact, we, we increased our revenues from a little bit in this division, uh, from a little bit over 11 uh, million US dollars in financial year 10 uh, to just under $20 million. So in two years, we've doubled our wholesale internet uh, or IP transit revenue. Uh, why did we continue to invest in this product? Uh, one of the key things we looked at was the growth rate. Uh, this top graph here shows the increasing demand for data. This is historical from 2006 to 2011. Uh, and this is the, uh, the amount of gigabits 
uh, of demand. As you can see, you know, there's really strong fun fundamental uh, usage increase, uh, which obviously throws th flows from uh, end users using more data. Uh, the amount here in, in comparison that an average user uh, in Australia consumes every month on a world scale is still very low. You know, if you look at European countries, the US, France, Germany, uh, Italy, you know, and the outlier Korea, they, they tend to use more data. They've had broadband and fibre to the home for a lot longer. Australia's still very low, so there's still growth you know, for that Australian column at the end there you know, to actually increase the amount that the end user uses. And this is a telegeography graph, the guys that sort of chart uh, capacity use around the globe. And this is the, uh, the forward-looking version of the first graph. So here we are at 2011, right down here on the bottom left with uh, around about you know, 350, 400 uh, gigabits of demand. Uh, and they're predicting that to go to sort of 25 terabits of demand in 2020. So the thing we learned from this was that even, even in a market that's saturated at the retail space, there's still huge opportunities for a business uh, either in the wholesale space or, or in a part of that delivery. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the revenue growth has, has been there for our business. Uh, and then we looked at what other parts of the market, you know, we could move into. Where was there a, a demand, good, strong demand, probably limited amount of supply, uh, and uh, you know something that required a strong brand. You know, Vocus had built a brand in providing wholesale internet access. We thought that this could translate into other parts of the market. And so, through uh, you know really searching for what we wanted to do next, we came up with uh, with one part of the market which we thought was very strong, and that was uh, data centres. You know, there were reports everywhere uh, in our press. You know, that data centre demand is surging. Uh, that storage needs are increasing, you know, people storing more data outside of the office. It's a trend that's happening uh, all across our, our CBDs. People who used to have small computer rooms or server rooms in their offices are now moving that data out to a data center. They actually want that data to be, you know, in a sound, secure environment rather than just located in their office. And I think that's a shift as much as the retail user today is using more and more internet bandwidth, the office is too. You know, the, the business is almost reliant on the internet and their data today entirely. Uh, so as that data becomes more valuable, as there's more data, uh, you know, the trend is that they're moving that into, uh, into data centers. So we thought this was a great area to invest in. Uh, in, 20, uh, in 2010, two years ago, uh, we, uh, we started offering uh, buying uh, a data center space. Uh, so we've got facilities in, in three locations across Australia now. Uh, some photos of our facilities, very standard data centres. Uh, this, is a, this is a LACNOG LACNIC, so I'm sure you've all been in data centres. Uh, but it's been a, a fantastic investment for us. We've grown from sort of no revenue in uh, 2010 when we were building this division, uh, and our last financial year's revenue was uh, 7.5 million uh, in data centres. Uh, and we should easily double that again for, uh, for this year. Uh, so again, you know, in a market that's already saturated, you know, we've had to look outside the retail space uh, into that corporate space and, and look at the economics of you know, where they're spending their money and where their demand is, and data centre was certainly one of the key areas. Uh, the next product we launched and we invested in was uh, fibre optic cable. So we're actually installing fibre down the street, uh, linking data centres to CBD offices, uh, CBD areas to other metro uh, business areas, uh, and we're actually offering that fibre product completely dark to the consumer. So you know, we don't have to invest in transmission equipment. We don't have the operational expenses of, of running that fibre. We can literally just sell the customer uh, what is effectively just a piece of infrastructure. You know, we have no power bill. We have no support staff uh, to manage a piece of dark fibre. Uh, and what that does is that allows the customer to do a whole bunch of more stuff. You know, they can do anything that they can think of. They can move you know, storage uh, outside of their office where that previously wasn't possible. Uh, so the, the if you give people more bandwidth and you give them dark fibre, they'll come up with m many more ways to use that, which leads to demand you know, for more fibre, more internet, and more data centre. So for us, the combination of owning a data centre and owning fibre in, uh, in that region was a, was a very strong uh, combination. Uh, you know, our, data so our fibre revenue grew from 1.8 million uh, in financial year 2010 uh, to about 5.8 seven million last financial year, uh, and we think that could be as high as 15 million uh, this, financial, this coming financial year, certainly on track for uh, uh, that to uh, more than double, and if not triple. 
And what we've seen driving that growth, so it's obviously from there, you know, to tripling is, uh, is big growth, but that's been the popularity of our dark fibre product. Uh, we don't have a lot of competition. The incumbent telecommunications companies can't offer dark fibre. You know, they have to uh, offer managed services, be that Ethernet, uh, you know, Wavelinks or, uh, or even old TDM services. And the reason they can't offer it is they never built their fibre networks with the concept of giving away the fibre or, or selling the fibre. Uh, you know, if you think back when our incumbent built fibre, they were rolling out 12 or 24 pieces of fibre down the street. Today we're rolling out 324 or 624 pieces of fibre down the street. Same build cost economics. You know, it costs the same amount of money to put a piece of fibre in the ground, whether it's 12 cores of fibre or 624. So with 624 pieces of fibre down the street, we can go and sell that fibre to uh, customers, give it away, and we don't have to, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, actually running out of fibre. So you know, phenomenal growth, actually, from, from uh, you know, 5.7 million and to hopefully doing sort of 15 million in revenue from that product. Uh, you know, in, in the space of four years, uh, and that's really down to the demand. You know, customers, once they realise they can get dark fibre, they realise that what they can do with it, they're not limited by speed, they're not limited, you know, by 45 de day delays to increase their capacity. Uh, they start to buy one piece of dark fibre, they start to want their whole network to be, uh, to be dark fibre. One of the things when we started uh, selling dark fibre, uh, all our competitors thought we were crazy because, you know, we'd never end up with repeat business. Once you sell someone dark fibre, they can run however many 40 gig waves if they want. Uh, so you don't get that incremental upgrade revenue where somebody buys 100 megabits, comes back the next day, buys 200 megabits, comes back six months later. Uh, what we found is we actually get more money for the dark fibre up front and possibly we get less money at the end of the contract period but averaged out over time, we're net positive in terms of we're giving away a premium product to the customer so we can actually charge more over the contract length. Uh, so dark fibre has been very positive uh, for the business. Key markets that, that have attracted it uh, is broadcast and media, uh, banking and finance, and IT outsourcing companies. People that actually want to sell equipment, uh, you know, sand, service, storage, uh, but they actually work as a fantastic channel for, uh, for uh, you know, selling that dark fibre into, into clients. Uh, and as I mentioned, this product combines absolutely beautifully with the data centre. You know, every time we sell a data centre rack, they typically want to connect it somewhere else. It's not very unlikely to be uh, just an island uh, as a data centre rack, not connected to anything. So the cross-sell is uh, fantastic. And so all that put together really, you know, in a market that most people define as sort of saturated, that, you know, really there isn't huge opportunity for new providers or, or fast growth in that market. Uh, this, is our, this is our company revenue in the last five years. You know, we started with sort of our first year, 500,000 of revenue. Uh, and then today, this last financial year, we had uh, 47 million uh, was the final result. And uh, with all that growth coming from fibre and data centres uh, and internet, we hope that, that this financial year will be over 65 million in revenue. So it is possible, uh, you know, in a, in a well-developed, saturated market to have a new provider come in. I think you just have to look at things intelligently and find the, uh, the best places to invest your money. Uh, so, um, final thoughts here is really all markets react in similar ways. Uh, Australia isn't particularly special in any way. It's just, it's much more easily defined because it's that island and because we have a small population base. Uh, it is possible to grow in a saturated market. Uh, I think we just need to think outside the box. You know, be a supplier to the people that have to buy more services from you rather than necessarily be a supplier to the uh, part of the market that uh, that's saturated. Uh, with no growth in retail, uh, wholesale was a great option for us, and it was a good option because there was little competition. You know, as I said, everyone had the view that retail internet access was saturated, so you know the internet space was uh, was a very unattractive space. We'd actually seen people pull out of providing wholesale, so we saw the number of competitors we've had in the last five years drop uh, because they, their view was that there was you know no growth in in revenues in uh, in retail internet. Uh, the demand for corporate fibre and data centres is growing significantly. Uh, I think, you know, we've quashed the view that, you know, giving away the fibre asset to a business, you know, is a negative. Uh, by doing that, we've created more demand. We've created more demand for our data centre space, and we've created more demand for the, uh, for the internet product. Uh, so, you know, I think certainly there's a, there's a view in the world that giving away dark fibre, really, uh, you sell it once and you never see the customer back. And that may be true on an individual route, but once they 
customer understands the power of having that fiber, they come back and they want all of their links on, on dark fiber. Uh, and one of the positive things is that, you know, with that trend of, subscri of ISPs consolidating, uh, you know, by investing in other areas, uh, we're now no longer uh, dependent on that single product of wholesale internet access. So anyway, that was a little bit of, I hope, uh, interest, uh, a little bit about the Australian market uh, and how we saw an opportunity uh, to grow in that, uh, in that already sort of crowded market. Uh, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak here today. Thank you. I don't know if we've got time for any questions, if anyone wants to ask one. I can't see an MC anywhere, so I might have to do that job for them. I apologise to the people sitting on the right-hand side. I thought about getting two pointers, but I probably, probably wouldn't be able to skillfully enough uh, point on both screens. I am not an ISP. I work for Lagnit, but I, I think that many of the people here maybe can uh, be, or they, they can feel like you because they are also ISP and probably they have the same problems. Like uh, the market is not growing anymore, it's, it's very difficult. And what I wanted to point out is that, uh, well, now I see why are you, you have all these awards because, well, it was a great presentation. And also, there are some ISPs in other parts of the world that uh, now that they are facing this challenge, they are, they are thinking, well, Probably we can take a part of the chair of the content providers, and that's, that's how we can survive. And it's good that, that, that you are showing that there is other ways to do it, to, to how to grow and how to, 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 to increase the market and, and, and the revenue. Uh, what I, and also I want you to ask, is, is, is a possibility in the future that this kind of two markets, they converge, for example, that ISP also become content providers, and maybe content providers probably like Google or Netflix, like buying other ISPs in order to build like a, the whole change of, 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 of services, not only content providers and service providers, but also the, the, the same thing. Like, will it, be, will it be that the future, or, or just what is your perspective to that? I don't know. Sure. I think um, well, Google, Google has enough money to pretty much buy everything, so that's always a possibility, right? Um, you know, in our market in Australia, we are facing that real issue that we're getting no new subscriber growth. Uh, costs are actually increasing, but revenues are not. So at some point, the retail ISPs need to find new products themselves. And what they're doing now effectively uh, and doing well is starting to bundle in VoIP services, starting to bundle in IPTV, starting to you know, try and find products where they can make back some additional margin uh, from those users. Uh, you know, It's an interesting position because you know, they're going up against some very dominant providers in the IP, sorry, in the TV space. They're going up against the cable operators, uh, and their product, you know, they're locked out of content, so their product isn't anywhere near as good, and it's quite often more complicated. You know, an IP TV product, you've got a cable up to your, uh, you know, your television, uh, you know, an Ethernet port or, or potentially wireless, which may not work as well. So, you know, their ability to actually succeed in that market is probably, you know, quite tough. Uh, in the VoIP space, you know, becoming a voice provider. Uh, they're, they're certainly indicatively starting to become a lot more successful doing that. Uh, and I think that's filling up some of that lost revenue that they're, that they're seeing through, you know, uh, cost increases and uh, uh, revenue not. Uh, but at some point, these ISPs, you know, need to find other sources of revenue. So I think it's probably the reverse, that ISPs are going to become content providers or, you know, uh, and we're certainly seeing that with our incumbent buying you know, movie databases and uh, you know, offering home boxes that can download movies on demand and things like that. So uh, they certainly need to reinvent themselves, and I think that's, that's common across the globe. Great. Thank you very much.